Um, hello, let me know when we're live. Yeah, thank you so much for, for joining us. We're going, I'm going to be um, introducing these two incredible humans, um, and then uh, we'll be engaging in a keynote conversation with Emily Mann. Um, and you all were so quick to your seats, and now we're live. Great. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for the final session of the main sessions for the first national now um, conversation on parent support in the performing arts. Um, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce on our left here Mary Hodges who is the assistant director of Slave Play. She has participated in the Lincoln Center Directors Lab um, and it has a prolific work on her resume as both an actor and a director in TV film and the stage um, and she will be engaging in conversation with our keynote guest um, who, who most of you I'm sure know um, her extensive work. This is Emily Mann, the artistic director of McCarter Theater Center. Um, she was just recently inducted into the American uh, Theater Hall of Fame. Um, it, it is my pleasure to be able to introduce her to you um, because I, I'm going to be reading her credentials, which I, I admire so much. But in addition, her reputation um, throughout the theater industry has been in creating a legacy of support. And so we invited her here today to speak on her experiences. Um, Emily is a multi award winning playwright and director in her 30th and final season as the artistic director and resident playwright of the McCarter uh, Theater Center. Um, during her uh, tenure, Emily wrote 15 new plays and adaptations, directed over 50 productions, produced nearly 180 plays and musicals, supported the work of emerging and legendary playwrights, received the Tony Award for Outstanding Regional Theater, commissioned the Tony Award winning play Vanya and Sonia and Masha and Spike by Christopher Durang, and opened the beautiful Roger S. Berlin Theater. Um, I, I, I'm just going to go through a, a few of the select awards um, that the Tony, the Trauma Desk Outer, Outer Critic Circle nominations. Um, this past June, she was awarded the TCG Visionary Leadership Award, and in November, she was inducted into the American Theater Hall of Fame. Um, my, you can you can clap for that. I know, I know. She was like, make it informal, make it a conversation, and I was like, okay, but I'm also going to make it about you. Um, <laughs> surprise. So. Um, my, my engagement with Emily is that I have, um, I have jumped at the chance to attend any panel that was within driving distance um, where she spoke and finally I was able to connect with her at TCG and get her contact information and so it is my greatest pleasure to welcome Mary and Emily here for this keynote conversation on parent support in the performing arts and thank you so much for what you've done and what you're willing to talk about. Thank you. I think Emily needs a nap after that listing, right? <laughs> um, and speaking of which, let's just start with, you've been busy this year. I yes. have. Um, what is it like, before we really dive in here, um, to receive, to be accepted into the American Theater Hall of Fame? What, what um, was that like? I have to tell you that it was one of the sweetest moments of my life. And part of what made it so sweet was, you know, having, you know, it's frightening to go back into being a freelance artist again. So to have that at the time, it couldn't have been better. But also because my dear colleague, Mara Isaacs, whom I worked with for 18 years, and has just, you know, has gone off and made her own extraordinary um, producing career, had just become a superstar with eight Tonys for Hayes Town, And she introduced me and burst out sobbing during it, during the introduction. So it was a very emotional night. Um, and to be um, the honor of being, I looked around the room and looked at all of those names, the giants of, of the world theater, and to be thinking that I was going to join them was just one of the most amazing feelings I've ever had. So t I just sort of took a big exhale. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, congratulations. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I'm going to read a quote. And I'm citing um, an article from Princeton Info. Does that sound right? Um, dated September 23rd, 2009. OK. <laughs> quote. Being a mother definitely made me a better artist, no question about it. You understand the human race by having a child. And feeling that much love 
It's just astounding. It affects my writing, my mentoring, and my giving to the education department and my raising money. All of it. I'm looking at Erica Nagel over here, whom I spent many years with in, in that capacity. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, kind of, if we if we were to do, since we're inducted into the Theater Hall of Fame, and a retrospective, if you will. And when you spoke those words in 2009, um, and being a mother artist, um, reflecting back and thinking about that to where you are, and your son, where he is in this world now, what, 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 what comes to your mind? My grandson. <laughs> oh, yes. He's two and a half. Oh, and I'm completely besotted with him. Um, I totally agree with myself. Okay, great. Uh, <laughs> I think being a mother, well, because, you know, we all as artists work from our experiences and our hearts and our guts and our mind. And until I had a child, I mean, that level of love. I had had great love affairs in my life, and I also adored my parents. But that love is so particular. And so much of the human race does experience that love in their lives. And I felt like I had actually finally joined the party. Um, and that I could speak to people in a different way, having had that experience. I mean, it's like... You know, when you're a virgin, I mean, you don't know, to, you don't know what you don't know, right? <laughs> and I think um, motherhood, parenthood is, is the same. And let me tell you, I think you, if you are enjoying being a parent, just wait till you're a grandparent. It's just mind-blowingly wonderful. Um, it's, it's that level of love, and it's different. And you understand the generations, and you understand aging, and you understand legacy, and you understand the need to give and how to give in a completely different way that is so enlivening and enriching. Um, and that's gone into my work. I mean, I don't know about you, I just think no experience is wasted when you're in the theater, right? whether it's tragic or whether it's joyous or anything in between, we put all that into our work, right? Um, but I would say this is the biggest, is being a parent and grandparent for me. So then we'll segue right into... Yes. Uh, what advice would you give your younger self, the mother, director, playwright, producer, um, when the support for your work at the time may have been lacking? Were there places when? Um, well, I can say it from being on this side of it that I would tell my younger self it's going to be all right. Mm. That you can be a good parent and a creator and worker in the theater. Mm. I know that two things happen. I always, you know, seem to have tech when my son had an important event in his life. Yeah. Either my <laughs> own tech or someone's in the theater that I needed to be at or um, a dress rehearsal. Or, and I kept thinking, what am I missing? What am I missing? And what is this costing him? And then when my son met his wonderful wife, my daughter-in-law, he said, I love her because she is as passionate about her work as you are. I didn't want to marry someone who wanted it to be all about me. I wanted what you had. And it was like, wow. Whew. I mean, because I didn't know whether that worked or not. Yeah. Yeah. And then my daughter-in-law, maybe she's just a very smart woman, but she is a very smart woman, but she said to me, just before they got married, she said, I knew I could marry your son because of how much he loves you. And she said, I've always judged men by the relationships they've had with their mothers. And he loves and admires you. So I feel like I'm okay. 
And again, you know, <laughs> tears. Yeah. Um, so that's what I would tell myself. It's going to be okay. And there were hard times. His adolescence nearly did me in. Mm -hmm. He needed me more then than when he was three. Wow. Or five. That's or not nine. encouraging. My son's uh, nine. Oh, oh, oh. And that's when I realized I had to rearrange things at the theater so that I could, I did not miss a dinner with him. And I had to lock it down. Mm. I could not let him out. <laughs> and I just took, he was going to run off the cliff. I just took him by the scruff of the neck and said, no, you don't. And I got my mother involved, grandparent, oh my, he, she was a great grandmother. Uh, she sat him down. She said, oh, no, no. No, no, no. <laughs> and he listened to her when he couldn't listen to me or, or my husband. So, um, but it can be done. That's what I would tell my younger self. And you're going to, you, it's going to be good. And he is not going to feel like you chipped him at all. Quite the contrary. And my mother used to say that a happy, fulfilled mother is a good mother. Can somebody write that down for me, please? Is that in the archives? Wow. Okay. Um, so then let's go into, because I'm thinking all about what you're saying. It's you know, dropping some gems, Miss Emily Mann. Um, so then let's go into what are one of the um, earliest memorable experiences as a parent in the theater? Oh, interesting. Well, there are two that just flashed. One was my son was like two weeks old nursing, and I had a reading of my then new play, Execution of Justice, at La Mama, and I thought, and, and I was going to be directing it, and then I thought, well, how am I going to do this? And... <laughs> You have to understand this is, um, you know, like 1983. So it's still a little bit, not quite the 60s, but people in the room all grew up there, you know. So I basically slapped him on my breast and directed with him nursing. Because I couldn't take too many breaks because it was a new play and it was a mess. And I had to get it together for the reading. No one batted an eye. The milk didn't dry. <laughs> and he, he was perfectly happy. So that's one I remember. Okay. <laughs> Another one I remember is um, I directed for the first time after that reading, three months after he was born. And it was for Mark Lamos at Hartford Stage. And he'd never had... Uh, director who would, well, I think I may have been the first woman who directed there, but he'd never had a mother, certainly, directing there. And he said, well, what do you need? And I said, I'm going to need to bring a woman with me. We'll have to schedule the breaks around my nursing schedule. I'll need another apartment with a crib. He went, done. That was the first and best time I ever had. <laughs> but it was because he was a good friend, and he wanted me there. And mm -hmm. then he, he, he used to call it the Emily Clause. When other women would come to direct there, he, he knew to ask, well, what do you need? And by the way, I did not pay for that extra apartment or that crib. I did pay for the childcare. Um, but, and it worked. I could do it. Um, the third one is the great Alan Schneider. You know, the Alan Schneider Award at TCG? He was directing at the Guthrie when I was an apprentice there, and um, women weren't directing at that point. And I met him and told him that that's what I wanted to be doing, and he said, well, you know, and he was used the British term, a pram in the hallway is a death to art. Oh. <laughs> Basically, no woman, if you want to be a director, you cannot be a mother. <laughs> and he was so wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I liked proving him wrong. But those were the days when... Um, and I'm just seeing so many brilliant people in here with their 
babies and bumps, so I'm really glad that no one has told you that, or if they have, you haven't paid any attention. Um, it totally works, and it just, oh, mm -hmm. goodness, who is that over there? Oh, oh me. hi, darling. Oh. <laughs> so then, this is not on my list. Um, Good. Are you then still, like, are you surprised when you hear other parents talk about the struggle that, um, and not receiving that support when they're offered jobs or hesitant to take a job? I was just... Oh, so gosh, no. Surprised. Not surprised in the least. Oh. I mean, there was no support. I had to fight for it every place I went mm. when I was freelancing. And then at McCarter, we made... You know, I wanted to make sure that it was a child-friendly theater, a family-friendly theater, um, and I wanted to make sure everyone had what I had to fight so hard for and make sure that um, people felt very supported in it. So, um, obviously, for the for staff, child care leave and all of that, but we set up... Um, uh, dressing rooms. When, when, when there's a, a nursing mother, we set up places to either pump or nurse. Um, when people come to, uh, you know, just depends on how far along you are, what your needs are, to make sure that we hear what people need and we do our best to help them out. So even when, when Nicole Ari Parker came just eight years ago, she had her two kids over the summer and she said, what am I going to do with them while I'm working? And our Wonderful production stage manager said, well, my kids love the Y camp, and we can figure out, you know, company management can get them there or pick them up. We were always working to see how to make it work. Right. I'm often told we're a very, we're a rarity. Mm -hmm. I'm not surprised to hear that. But um, I think sometimes you just have to tell people what you need. Mm. Often they will say no. And then you have to have a plan B. Or C. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I'm always thinking, so how can we get that word surprise taken away? Yes. You know? um, and I think it is like um, having a conversation. Mm -hmm. And if in mass, all of the parent artists, you know, spoke up. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a start by having a summit. And we need to probably have them twice a year to make enough noise to get it noticed. I think that's right. This is so important what you're doing and so exciting. Um, and I think the more it gets into the conversation, I mean, a lot of people don't think about it who are, you know, in charge because it never was part of their lives. You know, they never had to think about it. If they were guys and they had families, um, you know, then it wasn't their issue in those days, right? So there was someone at home taking care of things, um, in my day anyway. Um, then there are a whole lot of folks that are childless who run theaters, we know many of them. Um, it doesn't reach their consciousness. I mean, so having the conversation is the beginning, I think. And, you know, say with Mark, he was really happy to be a pioneer in this. He felt very good about himself. You, know? mm -hmm. <laughs> you give them the opportunity to feel that they're, they're doing the right thing. You know? So you um, mentioned um, your mother mm. um, as a support system. Um, yeah. What other support systems did you have in place? Because I'm guessing your son, at the time when you went over to the McCarter, was seven? Six. Eight? Six? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then I was a single mom. Okay. I was no longer uh, married to his dad. So I was a single mother running a theater. And really, I did it because I wanted to keep my son. Mm -hmm. So it could not fail. Um, so um, I did not have a partner at home supporting me. Um, I went with a huge cut in salary and had been saving since... I don't know how I knew this, but I was saving since I was a kid for childcare, because I always knew I wanted a child. <laughs> I always knew I was going to do something with my life. So I spent a great deal of my salary on childcare. Mm -hmm. 
So I had um, everything from live-in people for a while, um, and then um, part-time workers when he was more in school, but I, and it got older, but that was a support. And then I would say I had women friends who were incredible. Mm -hmm. And um, some of them would take their kids with my son and do after school things together so that I didn't feel bad because I couldn't, you know, get home till six, you know. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then I had a fantastic second husband, so. <laughs> so I think you've already answered this, but this is like the part two of that is so taking all of that support, how did it like play a significant role to where you are today? I mean, I think. We well, you know what's interesting? I was just interviewed about mentorship because I'm, I'm, I'm a mentor to a, a, it's one of the things I care most about in my life. And everyone says, well, who were your, your mentors? And I think, I didn't have any. And that's why I believe so much in it. I want to give to people what, what I didn't have. And I didn't have the support. I was always told what I couldn't do, except there was Mark. He was the one and only that I had to fight to get what Mark gave me. So that's why I mention him, because that's the positive. Um, the idea of mentor, that word makes, you know, when it first started being used all the time, it made me laugh, because I thought, everyone wants a mentor. Well, uh, well sure, but... You know, and then I realized, oh yeah, um, but I didn't have it. So I do a lot of mentoring within the theater itself, with the staff and with my, with the interns and apprentices, but also in the profession. Um, but I didn't expect help, and I didn't get much. I fought really hard, but hopefully, because and my generation did fight hard there are more places that will give you what you need contractually than when, when I started. But I don't know that. I just know we do. Um, but I think there are more places open to it than in the old days. I'm not sure. Do you know? You probably know. <laughs> Rachel probably knows, yeah. right? Yeah, we're compiling a, a national list right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's starting to set a precedent for the work that's come up all day today of, oh, this is what you need to be meant. Right, right. And that it, it did come from women's leadership. Yes. Like you said, we know that we're capable, it's the structure that's the problem. Exactly right, exactly right. Yep. Yeah, so thank you. Um, so you spoke a bit about. Um, just a moment ago about what you've set up in place because of the lack of support maybe mm -hmm. you have received mm -hmm. and um, at, at, the, at the university. Um, well, we're not at the university. We're in a building at the university, but we're a not-for-profit. The campus, the theater. Um, yeah, the theater. right. right. Um, so, um, and now you're setting um, an example, um, a legacy, of what other institutions can do mm -hmm. um, and of what other smaller theaters can, can do. Because I think some theaters think, oh, our budget isn't like, you know, the public or isn't like the signature, mm -hmm. so we can't do much. Mm -hmm. But there's always something that you can do. Like I've brought my son, if there's a space, mm -hmm. any little space in the back that I can bring my son and he can have his Absolutely. headphones on and his tablet. I take the space. So I was like, oh, I was like, oh, we're so sorry. You know, it's just this corner. I was like, oh, we take the corner. Yeah. That's yeah. fine. We'll take Absolutely the corner. Absolutely right. And and it's <laughs> it's it's also shifting attitudes of where you go. Yes. So that um, I work with a stage manager who actually was able to be a mom because she worked for 28 years with me at the theater. And it mm -hmm. was all about when she was pregnant. We made nap rooms. When she was nursing, she had her own place to go. When her kids were going to school and camp, how did we work that all out? Um, so I have this, this, this thing with her where I say, I want every single parent, 
for you to have a conversation with them, whether they're acting, directing, designing, composing, whatever it is, that you find out what their needs are. And she just does that. Um, but if you come into a situation where you're freelancing, you can also then, if you're directing or, you know, that you say to the stage manager, this is a child-friendly room. You know, you can set mm -hmm. rules or you can ask these questions. I mean, if you came into a room with, with a child and, and, and um, can we have the corners? Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, right. just tell us what you need. Um, but I think, again, it's communication. I think more people will be open when you know what you need and not expecting that they will offer it. Right. Not, and everyone is different and everyone parents differently and everyone needs different things. And so you need to help the management understand what you need. Amen. <laughs> um, I wanna just open it, if, if that's okay. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments based on what we're just talking about? distraction versus like in my in my uh, bringing my son into um, creative spaces it's it's like this this dose of light that just yeah. brings everybody the up yeah. and, and more energized and, yeah and the work is actually as productive and maybe better mm -hmm. and I just I don't I, I how do we reframe kind of that that idea that uh, yeah that it would be a distraction or yeah. What do you usually, what is usually your role in the room, or does it change all the time? Uh, right. so it changes a lot, but he is most welcome in my theater company's room, and we just have a child-friendly... Like, so are you, are you a director? A performer and writer. And a performer and, and writer, yeah. right, right, right. Um, yeah, I, I know, I, it's interesting. If you're not a parent, it's hard to explain, but for example, I remember doing, I do yoga for the first half hour of every rehearsal, and so I just had, there were, and there was a husband wife with three kids in that company, and I said, well, why don't you bring your kids to yoga? Well, you can't imagine how much we learned from those kids, because they have perfect everything, right? That's how you do a down dog, okay. That's, you know, so I agree with you, they bring so much light and life and energy and beauty into the room. Um, I, I don't know how you change it, I just know how wonderful it is when you do. And my guess is, if you're a writer or performer and you have a good relationship with the director, I mean, there's some rooms that are very hierarchical, mine are not. So, you know, I don't know, it's navigating it. Yeah. Um, and also assuring them that if there's, you know, if they're a distraction that, you know, you'll find a way to get them out or to another place and you'll take care of it, you know, just, just making sure that they know that the work will still get done. Yeah. I think that's what's, for people who don't know kids, that's what scares them. I know I've yeah. been on both sides of it because I'm actor, director. And, um, and there was a point at one point where I thought I couldn't, but then I got tired of like, I'm not sitting at home and not doing this job. Mm, right. And so no, 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 no. I kind of phrased it in a way where I didn't necessarily ask, <laughs> unless I felt it was inappropriate material and content you didn't need to be around. Um, but I would say, um, you know, I don't have child care in place for this rehearsal. My son will be coming and this is what he'll have to do. Yes, that's good. So I didn't ask permission um, um, for, for that and it was fine. And actually mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. once he's there in the place and they saw that, oh, oh. they would say, Oh, he was so well behaved, you know. And I could take, you know, offense to that. Like, why? Why but wouldn't no, he be yeah. well behaved? Uh, yeah, right, right. Because, like you said, most people may have a perception. Oh, a child. It's going to be in room rehearsal. It's just like you know, taking a child to the theater, right? Or most recently, um, I was busy doing something in a rehearsal hall, and there was a class trip to where did they go? Uh, uh, Mark. There was a dance company at Lincoln Center. And my son has dance classes, and the dance teacher had tickets, and I had to send a friend with him because I couldn't go. 
And one of the other parents went and she told me, oh, there was people sitting in front of our kids, shushing our kids and telling them. Mm. Mm. So there's, you know, still a set of people that think children should mind their place in the arts. Mm -hmm. And that's amazing. They're mm -hmm. responding to mm -hmm. the dances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why shouldn't they be allowed to respond? They got their ticket, just like you got your mm -hmm. ticket. Mm -hmm. You know, go mm -hmm. move somewhere else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but these are people who are patrons of the arts, yeah. you know, and they're going yeah, and they're yes, shushing yes, yes. children. So it, there's a whole culture that has to be educated and retaught. Yes, and in a rehearsal room, you know, we, we, we have to be helpful to people who don't know. For example, one of the last shows I did, um, Rachel uh, Nix was, was nursing. And so we had nursing rooms and all that sort of stuff, but she was getting into a different schedule and so she was thinking she had to miss notes. And I thought, miss notes, N no. And so um, I said, why don't you nurse during notes? Just sitting there. Oh. And I said, is everyone okay with that? And it's interesting. Um, the men who were parents were all going, yes, great, everything. Um, and then the one kid who was just, just graduated from Julia went, you mean, <laughs> I went, yeah. It, it, and then we all realized it would be so good for him. <laughs> so she nursed during notes. And then it was like, well, that's just what we do here. And it was, you know, it took about a second for him to get cool with it. And, you know, but it was... It was a first for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. So that gave everyone yeah. some food for thought about conversations, conversations. reframing. Conversations. Yes. Um, any other thoughts, comments? I just want to affirm this idea of, exp this is me speaking, of, of showing them young, because we've done PAL conversations in universities, where we're like, we know you're not thinking about this yet, but you are someone you know well. And you can see how hungry these young people are to know yeah. that they're going to be validated in their options in the future. And so they have such an appetite to know how to make a supportive space. And I've heard stories now of how like third level ASMs have known that this is a human rights issue and have advocated for parents in the room. And so it goes oh, back nice. to this intergenerational conversation of expose them young. And then the strange, the strange behavior will be the people who don't know how to handle it. And so we, we, mm -hmm. we, flip, we flip the behavior there. So just thank you for that story. It's important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Question? Uh, well, sorry, a, a comment. Uh, I I, just that um, what has kind of clicked for me today in both in the earlier conversations and in this conversation is that the thing that is being so often framed up as a problem is actually the solution to so many of our <laughs> right. problems. Right. That to have children and parents and grandparents present at all stages and all phases of theater creation and theater performance is the solution to the problem that, that has been posed, which is like, how do we get people to value theater, to participate in theater, a new generation right. of theater goers, and, uh, you know, and uh, m people that from all you know, walks of life and, and, and of all faiths and creeds, whatever, that we have to, it starts in the creation and we just want to make the space not just open to, but inviting of parents and children. Then, then we're actually thinking holistically about yes. communities. And it's interesting you also bring up grandparents because what I'm finding, well, what happened with Rachel is that her mom decided to come and help. So, and so she... She, the mom would come during the week and the husband would come during the weekend. So the grandmother was in and out of the rehearsal room as well with the baby. And, you know, and we would stop for, oh yes, it's time for nursing. And then grandma would come and then she would watch a scene. And then, you know, and then she brought all her friends to the theater, mm -hmm. right? Um, so the, the having the generations is just so life-giving. It's so beautiful. So um, what I failed to mention to say when I was up there is that we can be a solution to this as well. We are putting together packages with, um, 
with PAL for institutions to hire us to come and give chi have childcare for rehearsals and have childcare for matinees, like we said, but, but in the rehearsal studio that's next door, you know, so you can have them in the room if you'd like. You can have them next door if you'd like. We, we provide all of the, um, the accoutrement, all the, all the things that is necessary then it, there, and then, you know, the parent can go next door and see the kid. So we have tiers of packages that we can sell institutions and we can work with you on having childcare right there for everyone involved, not just the actors, for anybody involved in that in that production. So if you ever have, if you have any questions about that, come and ask Rachel or I. I have a, que I have, I have a question related to that. Um, so because we work indoors a lot, um, what happens with kids and outdoor time for every, anyone or anyone? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. How do kids get enough outdoor time? I mean, I would answer that. For, with our company, we have, you know, we always have a couple of sitters on and we have enough sitters to have like a two to one ratio, you know? So if you would want a sitter to take your kid to the park or take them on a walk, they absolutely could do that, I would say. Other questions in the space? Can I get a time check too? We're good. Five, seven minutes? Great. Um, I was just curious, this is a question for both of you actually, if there was ever you were uh, with an institution that instead of you having to ask for something, the institution was already like, this is what we provide or what do you want? And how was that experience and how was that experience different than having to ask for a corner or having to ask for an apartment? Um, there was, I can only speak of, um, uh, I decided to go out of town, take a change the first time I decided to go out of town to do a show. And I was like, oh, I have to do this show. You know, it's not like my phone was ringing. I was getting parts in New York. And I wanted to do a full production. So I decided to do the best of enemies down at Florida Rep in downtown Fort Myers. And so, oh, yeah. And so at the time, I didn't know that I could ask for certain things. I said, okay, I'm just going to I'm gonna take this job, I'm gonna find somebody to sublet the apartment. And I asked and I begged my mom to take him for seven weeks. My mother's in Virginia. And so I don't have any family here with me. So it really is myself and my son. So I like did all the research and I was like, oh, he's gonna to go to my childhood school back in a small county in Virginia. Everything happened by email, by phone. I got him registered, transferred got him set up with my mom, I took the train. So this is what I told the theater, I'm gonna take the plane out of Virginia instead of out of New York. And I took the Amtrak down, got him settled, I had to get, get there at a certain time. And then the next day he started school, I sent him off to school, and then I went straight to the airport. So then, let's fast forward, uh, an actor friend of mine said, oh, well, I went to this theater in the Midwest, and then I asked for um, a, a trip to see my son, and they paid for it, and then I asked for this, and then I asked for this. I was like, my job, I was like, That's right. you did? That's right. And they gave That's it to right. you? She's like, well, yeah, they did. And then mm -hmm. she said, I did have a relationship with them, but I still asked for those things. She's like, you totally need to ask for that next time. Mm -hmm. So there was a next time. I went back down, I, they offered for me to go down and do Disgraced. Mm. So then I spoke to the, I said, well, um, I will say going back, they did uh, research because I contemplated bringing him with me. Uh -huh. There was that discussion. I think he was second grade. And so they did all of this research for me about schools and all of this stuff. And, and I, I looked at some of them and then Florida has a whole complicated system with their schools. And so I was like, no, I'm not gonna have to them. Um, and so the next time, what I decided to do was like, I'm gonna ask for train fare, mm -hmm. um, travel fare for both ways, because I had to go out of my way to drop him off to grandmoms. So I did that. Oh, and I did ask for a trip. <laughs> I was so proud of myself. I did not get the trip, uh -huh. but I got the train fare. 
And that was just, I think, enough to push to say, at least to put it on their radar, that they're gonna be parents. I may be the first, or maybe not, that may ask for things, and they have every right to ask for things. Absolutely. And to compensate. And I think that was a big deal for that theater, to compensate me for the train fare. That is a good thing you did. Yes. Yes. So. For, for everyone in this room, actually, that you yeah. got that. But sometimes they will give more. Mm -hmm. And once you make the first step, then you go, well, actually what I need is. And what I found was I, I, I did not find it difficult um, to be on the road with my son, even alone, um, up until he needed to be in school school. Yeah. Yeah. He wasn't portable anymore right. after, after kindergarten. Yeah. Right, because yeah, right. you can go any place, and there's you know interesting childcare, and there are these interesting crushes. There are all different kinds of places all over for all of that. But then once you get into school and having to enroll a child in school for a short period of time, that can get tough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's where kind of like where I am now. Like I yeah. just said, no to not even go into the room to interview. Oh you know? yeah, yeah, because yeah. It's like. Yeah, and then also the conversation with your agencies and the management, you know, if they're not, you know, on your team. And I, like, keep having those same conversations with them. Mm -hmm. I'm like, look. Mm -hmm. I was like, he's older now. I was like, I can't go and take him, uproot him now and take him to Virginia, put him on grandmom, and grandmom's getting older. And it's like, yeah. I can't do that right now. You know, so it's you're like staying, the critical. You're and now I'm in saying, yes. Yeah, so now yeah. I have to. Now be careful about, okay, I, now I can't just up and say yes mm -hmm, to this. Mm -hmm. I was like, maybe there's another opportunity that can, I'm looking for certain opportunities here. Come on, be on my team, get with it, stop putting me in these positions, you know, to say, I have to say no. Right. What do you, what do you like, Well, I'm just thinking thing? what is commutable also. Right. It's not just the city. I mean, you can this get into Connecticut. These are, these are no, jobs but you could, out of state. You could go to New to. Jersey. Yes, you I can, can go. go yes. <laughs> yes, I would love to come to New Jersey. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But just jumping up and going to Florida. Florida Or to. Challenge One time Arkansas. And then somebody like Dallas is, was on the table for something. They have money. In yeah. Dallas. Okay. Yeah. Just saying. <laughs> they can do some stuff for you, yes. But we'll also often put in an extra airfare or, you know, mm -hmm. when, when we very much want somebody who's either dealing with, say, someone's in L.A. Okay. coming to McCarter and either the performer or director needs to get home at least once or the... Um, the the partner needs to come, and so we, we we you know you can start asking for things, and not everyone has the budget, and sometimes we do, and sometimes we don't, but we try. Okay. Yeah. We got one more. I I I just want to contribute a really brief story to this, and then ask Emily a question. Um, this is not me. This is not like a, a fake friend story. I have a close friend <laughs> who, <laughs> who is a director, a freelance director, who uh, booked a gig at a regional house and, you know, a, a fairly big regional house. And um, there are a few people in the room who, who also know this mother who had the standard things she asked for to accommodate her with her kid. This is when her son, before he was in school, he was mm -hmm. young. And she asked for the larger apartment and the, um, the specific schedule for rehearsals, et cetera. And not only did they say no, they retracted the offer for her job. Huh. So, however, instead, this was just like a couple of years ago. Instead, wow. of, instead, mm. of, instead of accepting that um, and just being internally angry, <laughs> mm -hmm. she raised a stink. And she basically was like, um, I just want you to know, I'm not going to be quiet about this. I'm Good. taking this to my agent. I may take it to a lawyer, and I'm just wondering if you want to make that like worth your trouble. Like, is that is that is that is this the road we want to actually go down here, or can we have a conversation? And I was really proud of her because it ended up working. She got the job. They conceded mm -hmm. to a lot of stuff. They ended up like repairing a lot of that when she got there. And now she has a good relationship with this theater. And that managing director learned a good lesson. Um, 
But I wanted to put that in the room because even like, mm -hmm. I, I honestly think in this day and age, like don't even take no for an answer. Um, I think there's always something that you can, you can get. Um, but yeah, even in this day and age, not only was it a no, it was a retraction of a, of a job. And I'm like, how many people would not know that they could fight that? Mm -hmm. um, and she just happened to, and she did. But you can, and I think we all should. <laughs> That's and, a great story. Whew, yeah. And so, uh, uh, relatedly, but not really, my question for you, Emily, is... <laughs> um, it was very reassuring to hear what you would tell your sort of younger self um, about everything is going to be okay. And I'm just wondering, kind of along those lines, if there's anything that you look back and would do differently as a mother in hmm. the field. Well, gosh, you <laughs> no one's a perfect parent, right? So I'm sure there are a lot of things, if I really looked back on it, that I would rethink. But... Um, no, oddly. It's a nice feeling. I mean, given how it's all worked out, though. Um, every once in a while, what I would do differently is I would beat myself up less about, oh my goodness, maybe I haven't done enough for him, or maybe, I mean, sometimes when I was, you know, Princeton is sort of split between a university community and a suburban community. And let me tell you, the suburban moms would say some really cutting things to me about, oh, your son this feels so alone and things like that. Um, you know, and I would absorb it and hurt a lot over it and worry about it a lot. And I think what I would tell my younger self now is that's their problem. I look at her children now, they are not doing all that well. <laughs> so, you know, you do your best. And, um, and, and I think, you know, I, I really made a mantra of what my mother said, you know, that a happy and fulfilled woman is a, is a good mother. And um, if you're sitting at home thinking, blaming your child because you didn't, get, you didn't do the job you really wanted to do, you didn't quite do a, your best at that job because you said, okay, I, I'm gonna send my assistant to tech or I'm, gonna, you know, I'm not gonna do the full thing. And then you're beating yourself up for not being the artist you could have been. I mean, all those things, no, 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 no. Kids are resilient. If they're loved, they're loved. If you're a happy, fulfilled woman, this is what you can give. Um, so, I'm sure I made a lot of mistakes along the way in terms of the, um, of the details, but I did keep my eye on the ball. And I also surrounded myself at McCarter with extraordinary colleagues and some amazing young women, one of them sitting right there, I mean, who just, we, we were there for each other. And, um, no, I think, Keep your eye on the ball and, you know, love your work, do your work, love your child, and the rest will follow. I really believe that. Thank you. Well, holy smokes, yeah. I, I, just a huge thank you to these two brilliant women. Um, I, I, I know that I could... I'm going to be grabbing them for more opportunities in the future. They've been warned. Um, and uh, just join us tonight for a happy hour. We're going to keep talking with Mary as well tonight at the Art New York Theaters. And that'll be live streamed as well. Um, I just want to say a huge, huge thank you. <laughs> She's ready to go. Um, I would say a huge thank you to our partner, the public, again, for providing this space. Yes. What an incredible gift for us to meet. Um, thank you so much to HowlRound Theatre Commons for making this available to everyone. Thank you to Broadway Babysitters for taking care of our children on site so that we could have lunch with them, bring the babies into the space. Welcome, baby. Um, and thank you so much to uh, the new, 40, new 42nd Street Studios for being our child care sponsor because it's that sort of intentional giving that makes that work cohesive and possible just in the first place. So thank you all for, for coming. Join us for happy hour. And child care grants for in individuals and institutions, December 15th deadline. That's administrative and artistic. All discipline, all gender grants. Um, PAL awards to nominate family-friendly theaters that you know so that other parents can find them. And then the PAL membership so that we can start developing resources that really reach you. Just again, 
just a thank you if we could close out. <laughs> Thank you. M mix and mingle so, and enjoy. They're going to kick you out of the space, but swap as many business cards as you can. I don't know. Oh, man.